well, good afternoon, yes. <laughs> it's that line from, um, what's it, the Truman Show. Good morning, and if I don't see you later, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Good night. <laughs> Excellent throwback there, Gold. <laughs> Is it, does it just show that you're watching way too many movies during this year of pandemic? <laughs> Literally. There's nothing actually, else to do. I actually, with Heidi Melton, I've been going through so much TV and movies. We literally watched all of the Marvel movies, all of like just so much, so much. It's my oh, job. That's right so now. nice. For you. Yeah. For you. <laughs> well, um, yeah. Hello, everybody. This is so nice that you're here. There's 50 of us now, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. So, so cool. I've kept everyone muted. So if you could just keep an eye, it's just for background noise. We don't want to shush your voices. It's it's only for, for background noise. Um, I think what we're gonna try and do is have a little chat, first of all, for sort of 40 minutes, 45 minutes, see how it, how it goes. Uh, we'll try not to bore you. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, and then we'll open it for questions and answers. But if you have a question, please write in the chat uh, messages on the side in the chat, and it will go to my personal assistant, Steph, uh, who will then tell us uh, what the messages are. And if we haven't covered them, then we can we can talk about them. And of course, if we miss anyone off, um, raise your hand in the Zoom Zoom way at the end, and we'll try to get to you. So, uh, firstly, thanks to you guys, Jamie, Simon, and Golda. You're amazing to do this on short notice, and um, <laughs> oh, it's just I'm really, really thrilled to have you with me. Um, I asked some questions on Instagram about the brain and the singing brain. And I got way more replies than I ever, ever thought I might. Um, and I, I think that I, I thought about asking you guys to come and talk with me because I wanted to find a way to normalize the worries and issues that, that came up by chatting to whatever degree we want to by our, about our own experiences. Because um, it's funny to me that if you have a vocal problem, generally you go to a teacher, uh, or to an ENT. Um, and if you have a musical problem, you go to a coach. Uh, for interpretation, you go to a drama teacher or a director. But if you have anxiety, you assume that there's something wrong with you. And it's this funny assumption, isn't it, that, that you then don't think of turning for help. Um, and and I, I think that if these psychological worries aren't addressed then no amount of work on your technical singing or drama skills are going to help you because you'll remain quite stuck um so my opening question to you guys is what is your in your view psychologically is peak performance and when have you experienced it what things come together in a positive manner to give you your best shot at your peak performance Hmm. Well, <laughs> you <start> Jamie. <laughs> whatever. Um, I I would say quite honestly, like the best setup for me to have a great psychological performance is performing something I already know, like the back of my hand. Performing something that maybe I've gotten a lot of experience with. I have a lot of so so I have ADHD. And it makes learning music and remembering text very difficult. Um, so when I've had an experience to be able to go through something a lot, or I'm really comfortable with what I'm doing or the setup, that's usually going to be like my personal, like best setup for a good psychological uh, thing. But of course, <laughs> this career is full of learning new things and putting new things up on stage. And so a uh, good portion of my my personal schedule <laughs> usually is fraught with a lot of anxiety around this kind of stuff yeah so for me i think what i struggle the most with i actually have anxiety um and it's very interesting my mom studied psychi psychiatry when she was a nurse when she was doing her nursing degree and so i've grown up in a household of some of a lot of psychology, psychology textbooks. Um, and so 
there's always been this talk about having a calm brain around me, especially in my family. So I think I have the added benefit possibly of having worked through anxiety and, you know, psychological stress early on before I even started as a singer. So for me, peak performance has to be, my brain has to be calm. And there's ways to do that. The same way that you just said, Jamie, that if it's something that I've already sung a thousand times, not that I've sung for a thousand times because I'm not there yet, but mm -hmm. if it's something I've coached to death and I know the score better than the conductor knows the score, um, or it's something where I know for a fact that my, my psychological understanding of the character is strong enough that whatever staging someone gives me, I can make sense of it, then I feel secure but before any of that happens I do need a calm brain so I tend to do a lot of deep breathing to get myself like organized emotionally and before a show I really try to have as little household stress before I go into the theater but as you say life's happening all the time and you can't have that so there's there, you've worked up at least I have I've worked up little crutches to help myself get to a calm kind of brain and uh, usually it's me having to listen to music that's completely unrelated to the music that I actually have to sing so if I'm going to a theater it's usually me listening to either musical theater or really angry rap music or like super soulful R&B anything that's just going to put me either in like my childhood calm space or in just this weird Zen space where nothing's, you're just going moment to moment and you're not feeling like the pendulum is swinging way to anxiety. But I do shift to anxiety a lot faster than a lot of, than a lot of other people that I know. But I also am starting to realize that because this job is so high stress, there are more people who suffer from anxiety in this job in particular than in many other jobs because our job is extremely high octane, high performance. And when you mix that together, it's this beautiful mallet of cocktail of genius that can actually become either really good or if you don't manage how quickly and how, how much you spark, it can actually just explode you into what used to happen to me. I used to faint. My anxiety got so bad. I would sing and I would pass out. That would be it because then the synapses would just fire over shooting. And so that was how I started in singing. I had fainting goat disease. So that's how good my, that's how well I was managing my anxiety. Well, I was going to say, actually, I, we're sisters in this. I, I also do struggle. Like I, I clinically, I, I deal with anxiety as well. But it's funny that you mentioned like the music that you listen to going to the theater. I, whenever I'm getting, like, if I'm sitting in the makeup chair in my own dressing room, same thing. It's going to be classic rock or trashy pop music or whatever I have on my brain that day that I want to listen to that is not the piece that I'm about to do. Because if I do that, then I'm just going to start working in my head. And it's, yeah, same thing. I, I have, I, I also do that. I actually, I love a bit of trashy reality TV. <laughs> before going on stage. I mean, anything that means that I can sort of enjoy something that isn't related to what's about, what's about to happen. And, and for me, I mean, it's exactly what you said, Golda, this pendulum of kind of from anxiety to comfort. I don't know. I, I don't believe that peak performance is something that I, I feel that I have met often in my career, that all of the conditions have been peak. Um, it does sometimes happen, but it's pretty rare. And I think when we're younger, we're led to believe that we should always have it. And and I, I don't, I don't think it often happens. Um, and for me, it's that funny combination of wanting total relaxation in order to be feeling as calm as possible and physically relaxed as possible. But then you also need, and and as as little self awareness as possible. You also need hyper awareness because you need to realize how your body is working physically how you're to engage your brain and on stage in a in a in a operatic setup how you are reacting to your surroundings to your colleagues 
physically. So they're, they're, it's this funny marriage, isn't it, between total relaxation and hyper awareness. Simon, what do you? It's, yeah, peak performance is a sort of funny phrase for me. I would, I always try and sort of lower my expectations of my performance. I think it's a very, I think that if there's, I noticed when on some of your Instagram feedback, we had those, those that, that nasty word perfectionism, which is an illusion as far as I'm concerned. It doesn't, it can never, we can never be perfect. There's always something that will be, when we uh, go back, there's always something different. So lowering expectations is a very good way psychologically to um, get near to be satisfied at the end of an evening. Um, one of the things I, I try and do, I mean, I, it's very interesting you say about talking about other, other, I might, yeah, before, if I'm doing a performance and on the day of a performance, I have a routine. So it will always, depending on the hour that show starts, there's, you count back from the hour of the show, you count back maybe from the hour that you're in makeup. And I, I plan it. I'm a, I'm, I think it's, it reduces my stress by planning the situation. Um, and so I, I will plan how I'm going to get to the theatre. Uh, how I'm going to get, uh, what, which route I'm going to take. I will plan when I'm going to eat, what I'm going to eat. And I, I'm, a, I'm one of these sort of um, persons who will try uh, uh, utmost to eat uh, the same meal before every performance so that I know that my job, almost my digestive system knows. Because one of the things I can't do I, as I can't achieve peak performances if my digestive system isn't working properly. So um, I, will try and, I will try and do that. I think I don't then I, 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 might, I might watch the odd Netflix or go for a walk or something like that to keep my get to take, take my mind away. But once I do get in that makeup chair, then I'm then actually I'm trying to go into a sort of um, a sports psychology sort of mode. And I'm trying to go into a into a little bit of a zone and I'm trying to to, to be to stay very present and in the moment. I'm trying not to think about later on i'm trying not to think about the third act before i've sung the first act i'm trying to stay very step by step because that's the only thing I, and, and control the things i can control and be flexible enough and also open enough to be ready for things like i mean it can happen you know you can make a mistake musically a colleague can make a mistake musically you need to be alert and you need to be with it but i do find that if i'm sort of um on stage and i'm in a moment where i'm thinking Oh, is that bloke on the front row asleep or is he, you know, uh, I, I'm out, I've gone, I've, I, if I've had the time to see that, then I've gone out of character. And being in character is one of the key things for me to reduce my stress. Because of course, I've done all the work. I've been probably been, uh, if it's a new role, we've, we've done six week new production, we've done six weeks, eight weeks rehearsal, if it's a Wagner piece, you've been doing the same thing, you know the piece. Now it's the time to just let yourself get out of the way and be the character. And the more I can be the character, not that is the way for me to get a peak performance, is to keep out of the way and trust that I've done the work and I can be the character. And then it can almost be sort of a little bit out of body. I don't know if you know if, if you guys understand what I mean by that. When it, when you're in the zone like that, and you are that you are the character, and it and the, and the evening's gone, passed, and you're suddenly you're at the end of the piece, and you just think, where did that go? You don't necessarily have to remember every single second because it, it, you just lived it. It was a lived it. You lived the experience, and it's gone. And then it's best I to think not too much to dwell on what just happened. But it's exactly what you said. It's perfect what you just said about how how you have to be open enough in that moment to live in the moment. Because I think that's where that's where a lot of us, a lot, where, especially when I was younger, that's where I got stuck because I was living for the next moment. And if I made a mistake, it was like, oh no, how's this going to ruin the next moment? And the thing is, what's really interesting is that we don't live out, like when you're in the middle of your day, you're not thinking about how you're eating the sandwich and whether or not it's going to ruin the next, the next 30 minutes of your life. You're just in it, enjoying it, being in that space. And I think that's exactly it. Like you, and I loved how you said you plan everything out. And what's interesting for me is that every production, every role I do, how I get to showtime 
it's totally different for every role. Like for something like uh, when I did my first Sophie, when I when it was a new role to me, I was with my score. I would always say aside in the morning. I'd wake up, and I would say aside two hours to just sit with my score, revi- review everything that I needed to review from any previous performance that I wasn't clear on. I would set that up. I do that, drink my morning coffee, and then the rest of the day go about my day, prepare myself for the show, and then get into it. But when I've done, now that I've done Sophie so often, I don't really open my score that much. I will literally, in the rehearsal room, I don't even look at my score. I just do what they want me to do and I go for it. And that's also the longer you're with a role, the more everything that you're doing becomes reflex. And because you, your body is so used to what's going on. And like you said, I love also the thing about your digestive system because it knows what's coming. It's already got the building blocks there. You're kind of just set up and it goes. And even if you tip a little off the rail, you've done it enough times that you know how to adjust and that the the adjustments are so minuscule and so microcosmic that it's just, you're back on track and it doesn't, and it doesn't take it. And also it's not a catastrophe if you go off the rails because you know you can get back on and you know exactly where you can get back on. Cause I'm, Louise, I'm sure you've also had this with Sophie. There'll be those moments where you're singing high, lovely, long moments. And then you're just like, and I've forgotten to count and I don't know where one is anymore. And then you're just looking at the conductor going, huh, I wonder when he's going to notice that I don't know what I'm doing. And somehow there's this moment of understanding between the, the, the prompter and the conductor and sometimes even the concert master that everyone's aware she's lost the plot. Bring her in. And it's just... And you're all back on track. And it's that note, that idea that we're all, because we're all in this little universe working together, everyone, it's like a Swiss clock. You know when something's slightly out of timing and then someone else will just adjust and cover and bring you back in and you can all just go on. And that's why I kind of love opera because it is that ensemble experience where you are all working together to build it. It's not And this is what I really hope that anybody who's watching this and listening to us talking is, please remember the entire show does not rest on your shoulders alone. I think that's the thing that somehow everybody's got in their heads. Like if you're Susanna in Figaro, the whole show is resting on your shoulders. No, number one, the story is called Figaro's Wedding. So let him take some of the slack. Number two, there are also other people in this world building it with you. So you have to trust them to take some of the pressure off you. And if, and if they aren't doing it, you also have to know that you can just give people some of the slack. And then you don't have to pick it up. Someone else will pick it up. You have to also leave space for other people to help. And I, think- I think that's a really interesting thing, Golda, because I, you saying that may, led me to thinking about leader recitals, because in that setup, it is much more on your shoulders. It's divided between you and your, your pianist, your, your duo partner. But I think then that leads us a little bit to talk about this, I don't know, fear of mucking up, fear of, of um, going wrong, because... I don't know what it is. It's this perfectionism thing. It's this worrying that the world's going to explode if you forget a few words, um, if you uh, forget to breathe in a place that you said you were going to. And, you know, the, the leader, the song recital is a terrifying entity because it is an hour and a half of you on your own, um, having learned multiple languages, probably, um, and often I found trying to fit leader work in amongst opera work, mm-hmm. um, trying to memorize things that then m- a lot of my anxiety with leader is all based around forgetting words, terrifying fear, almost fainting fear. Yeah. Seriously. You know, and Lou, I have to, I have to say, I, I love you for so many reasons. We know this, but like, One of the things I absolutely love about you is that you have been very open with that exact thing with, with when you have had a flub up in a recital and you knew it was super uh, noticeable to the audience, like addressing that 
on social media and saying, well, I'm human, <laughs> which is the truth. We, we, we are not machines. We are not computers. Our brains aren't just holding the text of what we're doing. It's holding everything in our lives at the time, you know? So there are going to be nights. I, I remember one time I was giving a recital and luckily it was here in Atlanta. So it was like a real hometown kind of crowd, but I was singing Gretchen am Spinata, which I've sung since I was an undergrad, you know, it was one of the first songs that I, I learned and I got into it. And just in the first turn, my brain just looped to the last, the last verse. And I stopped and I apologized to the audience. I was like, we're going to start that again. And we started again and it did it again. And I couldn't get out of that loop. And so I stopped and I was like, I'm so sorry. We're going to go to the next song. <laughs> <laughs> just skipped on. And thank God. I mean, I, I will say to all of you guys who are, are watching, who are supportive audience members, thank you so much. Because literally there was this guy in the back of the audience who was like, we love you, Jamie. You're our, you're, we, we just adore you. Don't worry about it. Like, I mean, like he was there with support and the whole audience was too. They applauded. There are so many times, Lou, you are so right. When, when yeah. all the words are on our shoulders for the length of a recital, that is hands down one of the most stressful situations for me. I, and when I get into the real anxiety brain in a performance mode, I'm thinking not, not like what's the next verse, I'm thinking what is the next syllable? I'm like syllable by syllable. I'm analyzing everything and I'm analyzing. Did I say that right? Was that an umlaut? What, what, you know, I'm just like, I'm picking it to pieces in my brain while I'm performing it. So <laughs> that's real fun. But <laughs> just, I mean, yeah. Thank I you. found that with, with regards to memory, sorry, Simon, with regards to memory, things I always forget words that I either haven't quite understood the sense of it um or and I wrote down another version but there, um, another um time when I forget them but I, I can't quite think now but um uh, I also did a recital in Frankfurt a year and a half ago where I did German uh Polish French uh Italian songs and then I sang Fair House of Joy Quilter which I've sung for a thousand and one years in English as an encore and started it three times. I went wrong three times and the audience luckily laughed with me. Sorry, Sai, you, you no, were- no, I'm just gonna say that I think there's, there was a question on again on the Instagram thing about, about that feeling of forgetting words and about the feeling like you're letting your audience down and things like that. And I wanna just go back a little bit to what Golda was saying as well about what all is that that when you walk out in front of an audience to do a recital or you do to, or to do an opera performance, the audience aren't your adversaries. They are there to have a great time, to come and hear some music, and they are on your side. Okay, there's going to be the old curmudgeon who might be there a bit grumpy and doesn't really, or wants to see you fail, but who cares about them? They're, yeah. they're, they don't give them any power or value. The vast majority of people want to do that, want you to do well. And I'd also say the same, actually, because it relates also to an audition situation, that the, the panel want you to come on stage and sing well. They don't want you, they don't want to have to sit through you not singing well and, 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 and have, they, they want you to succeed. And so I think that though often we have those obstacles. I, I don't want to sort of pick you up, but I think one of the things that as, singers and as human beings we have to try and control about this is the way we talk about them because if you say that a leader recycle is the most terrifying thing in the world guess what it will be yeah it tends to be a self-fulfilling prophecy so the way we talk in our the little voice in our head that talks to us can can also have a sort of counterbalance on the other side that is the loving, kind voice. And too much, too much of our lives generally, and it's not just about singing, but too much of our lives can be with the, the fear voice, the anxiety voice talking in our head. Well, I call him Mr. T, you know, from the A-team. Do you remember the A-team, anyone? Oh, my God, yes. <laughs> you know, when they, you know the, the guy who just calls you, calls you out as that idiot when you forget that line. But it's also, you've got to have the other person on your shoulder saying, it's okay. 
the audience are on your side. The audience are with you. If you have to start the song again, I've done the same thing. I start, um, I, I must go down to the seas again, to the lonely sea in the sky, the John Island song. All I could remember in the recital was Spike Milligan, uh, he, which is, I must go down to the seas again, to the lonely sea in the sky. I left my shoes and socks there. I wonder if they're dry. And, <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I could remember. And I sat, and I literally, I had to start the song. I started it exactly like you, Jamie, twice. Where, and then I had to go and look at the music over the pianist's shoulder because it, yeah. I got used to that loop. But the question is, do you then collapse in a heap and it ruins the rest of your recital or performance? Or are you able to then say, okay, we had a laugh. The audience are with me. I'm not going to let the anxiety, be, because the hormones in your body will suddenly go into sort of fight or flight mode. The adrenaline will start pumping. The more that happens, the less intelligent you get. Simple. The more adrenaline that happens, that's a sort of natural human response. We go into fight or flight and we get stupid because all we've got to do is run. The blood goes to the extremities. So it's about understanding and planning and knowing that you can get out of that situation. Or if you play your sport, you play a bad game of tennis, you, go, you move on to the next game. And you don't, it doesn't screw up the whole rest of the recital. So on that note, let's talk competitions and auditions more specifically, because that is, this feeling of judgment is harder to get away from. I mean, you did, you did talk about this um, in competitions, but uh, in auditions, but particularly with competitions, I always tried to make it feel like it was a performance rather than that I was competing to be best at something. Because to me, that is such a negative way of looking at such a creative thing that we do, you know? And why I wonder you whether you guys- Why do you enter a competition? I, I must admit, I came to singing a bit later than you. I mean, I was 36 before I became a professional singer. So I was always too old for any competition. So I'd love to know, why do you enter a competition? Is it to, you don't, because if you're entering it to win it, it's the wrong psychological, I think it's the wrong psychological approach. I think that a lot of people have done the competition thing because there's this, it's exactly what, I think it goes back to trying to be, to check your level against other people to see. And I think that that's something that has also been trained into us from teachers and from coaches and this whole idea, and especially at conservatory level, what I noticed, especially when I was at conservatory, there was always cast A and cast B, and then the, the, the cast C, and you were constantly competing with each other to get opportunities on stage. And that, that form of competitiveness, implying that someone is better than you, and therefore in cast A, and therefore or that's why they're in cast B because they're not good enough. I think that that's also translated into how competitions are also worked. And what's frustrating for me in that sense, which is why I stopped doing competitions. I entered two, I got into two competitions. I think I entered four and only got into two and only made it to the final of one of those two and then still didn't win. And it took, and but I never went into those competitions thinking I could win or trying to be number one. What I was trying to do is because I'm from South Africa and we don't have as much access as other people, as like people from the UK or from America or even from Germany to opportunities for auditioning. It was a way for me to see what the talent pool are like, what are people listening for? What are casting agents interested in hearing? And whether or not I am at any way in that league of voices that they're interested in. So for me, that's why I went into competitions, not to try and win. I was just trying to figure out, is it even possible to work in this world? And is it something I want to be part of? And I think when you go into competitions with that in mind and not trying to be number one, I think that does take the pressure off to some degree. And it is what you said, Louise, you do have to take it as a performance. I don't think anything, this is not, this isn't a competitive sport when the, like, it, the, what we're doing is not a competitive sport. What we are doing is a creative exercise. And to that end, you have to consistently remain creative and do your art. And some people will like what you do and some people will not. And the problem that I find with competitions is that if you don't win, somehow young singers are being told that their art is unworthy. And I don't think that's right. 
Okay. Not, and like, and I don't think that they, and, and I think that's what's important is that that also needs to be stressed. So for me, whenever I look at competitions, I, when I'm looking at young singers doing competitions, I always ask them, because I've been asked a lot by young singers, oh, do you think I should enter a competition? And I say, and I've always told them, enter a competition if that's what you want to do. But if you're looking to improve yourself, enter competitions where there are masterclasses involved, where you can have one-on-one -on -one time with these people who are sitting quietly, judging in quotation marks. Oh, hi, kitty cat. Um, <laughs> um, if you, so do that so that you can have access. And also when you're in competitions, it's important to also know that you as a competitor, you have the absolute right to ask the panel what they thought of your singing and how you can improve. It is not a blind, oh, I sang and they didn't like me. So that's it for me. You need to, competitions are not just there for you to prove your metal. They are there for you to sharpen your, sharpen your one, sharpen your actual mental steel. Cause there's a mental acuteness that's required in comp competitions that isn't as required, that isn't so much required in auditions because auditions, you're not doing them every couple of hours, one after the other. After auditions, you have a few days or a couple of months till the next one where you can recuperate mentally. But when you're in a competition setting, it's every day is an onslaught and every day is a new aria, every day is a new moment, a new round, and you're having to work your way through that. So in terms of being able to practice your resilience as a singer and as a human being, I, I can say there is something to a competition, but you have to also be very clear when you're a young singer of why you're doing it. Because let's be frank, only one person is going to win. Out of thousands who applied, hundreds who got listened to, and if we're all thinking that we're going to be that one, it's going to be very difficult when you're not. So you have to go into a competition really being willing to learn resilience. A competition is where you can learn to be a resilient human being. And being resilient is literally getting up when you have a bad singing moment and even if it means asking the, the panel, I'm so sorry, may I start again? And if they say no, then you know that that's not the space for you. And you, you learn from those experiences. But I struggled with competitions because it just, I wasn't ready. And also I, I came to singing also quite late, not at 36, but for a, for a woman, competitions also, have a cutoff date for, for women. You can only sing until, you can sing in competitions until you're what, 29 as a woman or something ridiculous. And I know for a fact, my voice only really started coming in when I was over 30 because I was secure with who I was and I knew what I wanted to do as a musician. And that's when I honestly think I started becoming interesting as a singer. Before then, I was just mucking around, trying stuff out that I'd heard on CDs, you know? <laughs> I, had, I had very little to say, and I'm not saying that's me personally. I'm not saying that anybody out there doesn't have a lot to say when they're 22. Kudos to you that you know yourself and your, your instrument and, and you know the, the, the psychology of a character so well that you can describe it musically with your voice in every moment and really live it out. That's beautiful if you can do that. I wanna hear those people, but I also know that for me, that wasn't me at 22. That wasn't even me at 26. That started clicking for me 28, 29. And then I was like, oh, now I think you could do a competition. And then I was like, oh no, I'm too old, Never mind. I actually, I, I was gonna say, this is, very, very weird to admit, but competitions and auditions have always been a really comfortable thing for me. Um, and it's because when I was an undergrad, so I didn't start singing, I didn't start taking voice lessons until I got to college. And so at that point, I didn't have any experience. And I lived in an area that wasn't a large city, still my hometown was where I went to college. Um, and so my voice teacher suggested that I start doing auditions for anything that I felt I could, you know, it would be appropriate for in any way, just as an exercise in getting used to auditioning. 
Um, and so for me, I, I did little competitions where I literally would, I, I'm not even kidding you, would win like $35 or, you know, like doing auditions for choral works or whatever. And I kind of carried that with me through grad school and eventually the gaining experience at getting up in front of a panel of people who were judging you became less of a, a fraught thing for me because <laughs> for, for as much as I just said about being nervous in recitals and with words and stuff like that, and that's still absolutely a thing with me, I am very comfortable actually in performing. I'm very comfortable when I'm on stage, if it's a good, comfortable situation, that sort of thing. And most of the time, even if I have my own things that I'm working through, especially in operas, it's a team sport. There are so many other things happening, so many other people. And like Lou and all you guys were saying earlier, if you get off at one point, you're, the music's still going to keep going and you can swing right back in. You're, it's fine. So I've always felt really, really comfortable in performances and I feel comfortable as a performer, well, as a storyteller. That's something that I've always, that, that, that is why I'm here is to tell the story and that's what I feel comfortable with. And so at some point, the getting experiences from auditions turned into, I know I'm good at my job. I'm just doing my job. And the job today is singing for this panel of people. I might win. I'm, you know, probability wise, I won't, you know, looking at the number of singers that are here, but no matter what, I'm getting up in front of these people who are casting directors and impresarios and agents and stuff like that in other places. And that's a good excuse to basically get to audition for these other people for the possibility of other things. So even if I don't win today, it's still a win. You know, I'm still walking in and I'm doing something that's going to add to my experience of getting up in front of people and singing and hopefully get me jobs beyond the, the competition. And that for me has actually served me really, really well um, in the competition thing. But Simon, I think you're absolutely spot on. I think if you walk into a competition and I, I'm going to preface this by saying I completely understand how this is a difficult line to, to straddle. But if you walk into a competition and your end goal of the day is to win that competition, then you pigeonhole yourself into one experience that only one person that day is going to have. And the fact of the matter is that a lot of competitions can offer a lot of other experiences that are very, very valuable to have as a singer. Um, so I always, when I, when I'm talking with, you know, younger singers and stuff like that, I always try to hammer home the, this can work for you in so many other ways. Don't just think about the winning. If you win bonus, if you don't, you can still walk away with jobs, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. I think the key yeah. thing to say there is that, um, it's a, it's an it, interesting, it's about, we're talking about seeing brain. It's a very clear mental approach mm -hmm. that do what you can control. Be in charge and take responsibility for what you are in charge of. Your musical preparation, your warm up, your routine, how you sing. You are responsible for that and you are in charge of that. What you are not in charge of and not responsible for is what the panel actually think of you compared to the other people in the competition. That's their judgment to make. You just, your job is to achieve your satisfaction. And, yeah. do, and do it for yourself before. I always, I mean, my, my sort of singing philosophy is always that it, it comes to you, in the, set, the, the character comes in through you and then out to the audience. And that any performance, has, any experience has to come into you first. And that I think that you have to take that, you have to um, do a little bit of work mentally before performance, like we talked, you talked about at the start, Louise, about um, we go to a coach for this and a, and a, a language coach for our, our text and, you know, a singing technique and things. It's to also time to take, take the time to use like visualization techniques, to use positive, re re positive affirmations, listen to the positive voices, put away the negative voices and do the little bit of mental preparation work like you would see a, a top sportsman do. Um, before you go and make that performance and understand that your objective, the first person you have to look at, look at after the performance is yourself in the mirror. 
in the dressing room and say, yeah, I was pretty close to my, uh, uh, to what I wanted to achieve. And I would also say to people about, I said earlier about lowering expectations. If you get to 85 to 90% of your potential in a, in a competition or a performance result, it That's really is. It's not the number of times you could say, you talked about peak performance earlier in your career, it, you in one's in a season out of the performances you do in a season, the percentage that are at a hundred absolute max capacity are going to be low, are not going to be as high. And it really is important then if you say, well, actually, my goal is to is to be at ninety percent of what I know I can achieve in the studio, for example, in live performance. That is actually a result. Of course, it helps when your ninety percent is maybe. Is, a, is still a high standard, but it's a result. And I think the competitions and the auditions, first and foremost, make yourself happy. Yeah, then, see, then be surprised, be overjoyed at what happens as a result of that. And it's very interesting what you guys have both said. Sorry, Louise, to jump ahead of you. But um, what's been very, what I've really noticed is it's also something that I also think about is that you have to treat it like a job. It is a job. And, a comp and whether or not your job is, if you think that you're, you're mentally strong enough to do a competition, then be a competition singer and really work your way. Make sure that you like prepare yourself, prepare your, your packages well enough. Know that you can sing any aria in any order. Work all the angles if that's, but understand that in that moment, in that context, your job is to be a competitive, well-tuned singing machine in that context of four or five days of singing like make sure that like and prepare yourself for that and there's a lot that goes into that that might mean oh you're not hanging out with all the other singers after after rounds because you're trying to rest your voice and prepare for the next moment that those are the things that you have to do but it's a job it's and it's how every sports person works like i've read a lot of books on sports psychology and they say the exact same thing especially people who are in competitive sports like marathon runners um even you know racing car drivers there's this kind of mental you know fast like fastidious kind of thinking that is required to be very tunnel vision and focus on what am I trying to achieve but what you're trying to achieve is absolutely personal to you and you've got to go for that and everything else exactly what Simon says is coming in first second third winning five jobs getting the popular vote from the audience that's all gravy but if you can walk out of every moment that you're in that competition and every round that you're in going I gave that I gave that 110% of what I could today and that's enough for me, then you've won. You've probably won more than you know. And it's this, and when I always tell yeah. young singers when, when they're asking me, you know, a lot of young singers at conservatory always wanna talk about, oh, how do we get through this role and get through this performance? And I always tell them, that's neither here nor there. What you have to figure out is how am I going to do the job of auditioning? Because when you're a young singer starting out in that, this business, that's your job. That was my job before I even got on stage. My job was taking auditions. That's the job. That's about before you get to having a career, that's about 60% of what your day-to-day -day job is. It's preparing your audition package, checking your emails to find out where there are auditions, and then like having to deal with rejections or people telling you what you should be improving on and having to figure out if that's something that you agree with them or not that's also another job that you do and you have to see them and be prepared to do what's mentally necessary but there's always I don't know a single person who has any success in any of their jobs and this is across the board you'll see it with CEOs you'll see it with sports people you'll see it with great managers there's an idea you have in your head of how something should work and then the next step is before you even do it, you need to plan it. And you, and you need to have steps in place so that if things don't go the way you intended, you can figure out how to get back on track to your plan. But if you don't have a game plan, you can't do this because it's, then it's all too, it's all just too at the, at the whim of 
anyone else. And exactly what Simon says, control what you can control and you can control the building of your plan. You can control, you actually can control the trajectory of your career much more than any manager or any casting director because it is within you to decide what roles you want to do now, how well you can do them and what areas suit you and what, what leader you want to do. And those will be the expressions of who you are as a person. And at the end of the day, that becomes more interesting for anybody watching to see than anything else. I think that, um, okay, sorry, Louise, did you want to say something, Louise? Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to say, well, it's slightly on it. I mean, for me, it's the, it's the flip side of this is that um, I, I absolutely agree. The concentration is needed. The sort of blinkered concentration to, to, for having a plan is absolutely needed. And it helps um, with steps, putting one foot in front of the other, basically. It helps. It simplifies things in a way. However, I have found that um, I've always done well in things that I haven't put so much pressure on myself that I've almost caved in. Like if I have a better balance in my life about things that I am doing outside, that I'm seeing friends, that I'm doing some things that, that make me human as, as a person, then I'm, and I'm not completely um, obsessing about, only about singing, I somehow can walk into the room of an audition and say, you know what, I want to give what I can give, and that is enough. Yeah. And if, if I only think about singing and about success in the future, I mean, we're saying the same things, but it is interesting to me not to put it too much pressure on one thing. If you think this is the be all in the end all, and if I get this, then my life is going to be made by this one event you probably won't get it because... No, I, I totally agree. I was, sorry, Jamie, I just, can I just jump in? I'll just say that I totally agree with that. I think that the, um, the idea is that you have to find, you have to take responsibility for what works for you. So you have to own that. You have to own what approach you take. You have to own it. You're not doing the approach that Louise Alder recommends or the approach that Golda recommends or whatever. You're doing your approach. Mm -hmm. And in terms of anxiety, then if you can get your planning in case, it can help a lot with the anxiety. But I definitely think that you have, to, it's very important to have a picture of what success looks like in your life. What, what does a singing career mean, a, a successful singing career, does that mean a successful life? Not necessarily. You, they, they aren't, they can be uh, separate things. So you do have to have balance and you do have to understand and going to an audition with the idea that if I don't get this, how am I going to pay the mortgage next month would be completely the wrong sort of pressure to put on yourself. And any way that you can remove that pressure really helps. There's an interesting, there's a, there's, I don't know if people have ever come across these, the inner book of tennis and the inner game of golf and these sort of sports sort of type books. And there's a great thing in the inner game of tennis where the um, tennis coaches, the guy's got a trouble with his backhand. And he kind of, his backhand, he's stiffening up on the backhand all the time. And so let's say that, let's say that's me on a high note um, or going through the passaggio or something. Um, the, and what the tennis coach does is make him not focus on the backhand, but make him focus on moving his feet. And it's that sort of brain gym of, of actually saying, don't focus on the problem in this phrase, focus on something else. And so when you go into an audition and don't focus on the, I have to get this job, I have to get this job, I have to sing, if I don't sing that high note right, it's, you focus on something else. You focus on the balance in your life or you focus on this, every breath you take uh, rather than the, the actual sounds you make in between the breaths. Uh, then those sort of things can really help calm your brain and um, keep you in a sort of, sane sort of state of mind really uh, because as soon as you start I've, I've done auditions where I have lost the job before I walked on stage I've heard the baritone maybe sing I've gone in for the, for the Toreador or something and I've heard the baritone before me go and sing the Toreador and he's got you know he hasn't got a bigger belly as me or something and he looks much better in that the tight trousers and uh, and he nails the e natural in the chorus and I'm going oh god oh my god you know and you're doing that and you're, okay I might as well just you know go home and so 
it's those sort of things that if you have, if you can stay out of that, stay out of that rubbish and uh, uh, keep in your little world, as Golder says, don't necessarily get sucked into the social side of those sort of things or the, or the banter. Stay in, do what you have to do to be the best. And everyone has to find what that is for themselves a little bit. There isn't a prescriptive answer. And I think all we're trying to do today is share some of our experiences. And I think it's good, like you, like in peak performance you said earlier, listen to some, like you said, you'd listen to other things. And I think if you put the pressure on your back as a burden when you go into a competition or an audition, you carry that burden, you're already at a disadvantage. <laughs> But there was another, like, I've read that book, The Inner Game of Tennis, and I also know that there was a musician, I think his name's Barry Green, he's a double bass player, he worked, he wrote a book in conjunction with the same guy who did The Inner Game, and he's written, he wrote a book in the late 90s, I think, called The Inner Game of Music. Yes, yeah. If anybody wants to read that, that's about the mental game of being a musician, and it takes the same ideas of competitive sports, the same ideas that they use in that in that book, The Inner Game of Tennis, and he's translated it into how that can function for musicians. And I read that book and it really helped me a lot when I was starting out because it, it's always because of singing, there's something, there's something so fundamentally clear to me how singing is such a, is much more of a mental game than even playing the piano or playing the violin because it's so in your body and we have to use so much imagination as it is. So we have so much brain activity going on just to produce sound. So for that, just for that, your brain has to be just this big, big, big muscle and it needs all kinds of information to feed it and to build it. So it goes beyond just making sure that your passaggio is in the right, that your passaggio is all lined up or your high notes are full of sparkle or you've got the depth in your low notes. Like as you can see, I have all down there. But it is such a big, big mental game. And, if the, and therefore the only way to give yourself advantage because everybody in the room is talented, the way you get advantage is you got to make sure that this up here is as fit as it can possibly be. So that's, so I would definitely recommend reading The Inner Game of Music if you haven't read it. Because there are also exercises in the book that you can do to help your brain and your mental acuity with just how to be a musician. There's also another book that he wrote called The Mastery of Music. And he uses like different, different instruments to teach you how to be a better musician. So. You know, sometimes when you're struggling with learning a role, you should maybe start learning it in the middle, the way that the violas start the middle of the sound and work your way out or start from the back and go forward. Um, and then there's an interesting chapter called Be a Diva. And that's how singers can teach other instrumentalists how to actually own space more. So it's very interesting. So that's another book that he also wrote, just in case anybody's looking for reading material. So I wanted to jump in because the, the word balance showed up a couple of times. And I really actually, this is something that's hugely present on my mind these days. Um, back in 2013, I think uh, a lot of you probably know I did Cardiff Singer of the World. It went well. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> two years after that, uh, almost two years after that, I hit my first panic attack. I had never had one before in my life. Um, and in those two years, my career just skyrocketed. It, it just, it all of a sudden I had a packed schedule. I was never at home. Um, and I can look back and understand now that there was just, I was having to learn too much music. It was really overwhelming. People knew who I was and that was a very new thing for me. And I started working with a therapist. Now, at that point, I started doing meditation, which I will say really helped me. I think a lot of uh, why that helped me is because it helped me carve out a portion of my day that was just mine, that nobody else got to have a part of. But even since that 2015, I've been working with my therapist, I've been continuing on with the career, and I will tell you, <laughs> 
last last year when 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 the pandemic really started, I was just going full force. I had just had my first uh, title role at the Met. I did last night of the proms. Like there were so many things that were benchmark success kind of things that came into my life, but I had been running a million miles an hour. And when I did the last night at the proms, I literally had had a, I was recovering from surgery, literally. I had had a surgery about a month prior. And then I, because of the surgery, which ended up being last minute, I had to learn Orfeo in the week in between when I finished with the proms and getting to the Met to start rehearsals. I remember on my birthday during uh, the, the rehearsals, I was actually, uh, it was the final dress for Orfeo. I got my first uh, offer to sing on Broadway, my Broadway debut. Um, and I also had full body hives because my body was processing all of this stuff that was coming through, all of this stuff that, like I said, benchmark success. These are the things that we are taught that you should look for, that these, that these things mean that you are doing the best you can possibly do. And as awful as this pandemic has been, I'm grateful for when it landed because I think I was a lot closer to burnout than I had ever imagined. And so in this last year, I remember before the, the pandemic came down, my therapist and I were talking and we were talking about balance because balance is something that is necessary for all of us. It's not just in the, you know, I, I'm not just talking to people who feel like they have to go win that competition, get these jobs, that kind of thing. I was in a position where I was just fulfilling the contracts that had come my way. I was just doing the things that I had signed up for. And when my therapist asked me what hobbies I had, I literally could not think of the things that I like to do, the things that are apart from music. And so in the last year, I've really invested myself into the idea of balance every single day, balance of some sort. Yes, I'm doing work. Yes, I'm spending time with my family on Zoom, or I'm going for a hike, or I'm doing things that get me outside of the brain of go, 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 go with the career. And I think that has been such a major revolution for me. And it's something that I have to carry forward. I don't want to burn out. I don't want to get to the place where I have full body hives because I've got a, a final dress rehearsal and a, a wonderful offer on my plate. I, I want to be able to function in life, to be a healthy person and a happy person. And I think it really takes stepping back from this idea of success is marked by the job offers or by winning the competitions. Success to me now is so, it's, it's a much fuller definition. And I just, I, it's, it's been such a present thing on my mind. And when you guys said balance, I just, I felt like I had to jump on this because I, me as a human being and me as an artist as well is fully fed by taking time every day to have balance in my life, to not just be like, you know, blinders on, I have to learn this role. I have to get ready for this. I have to do this, which is the pace that my life was at pre-pandemic. So but, you know. bizarrely, you probably actually now with the balance, with more balance, with taking that time out, you will be able to learn things a bit quicker probably because you're not trying to cram and cram cram there's a, there's a much more sense of peace in an inside peace that that is and in many ways you'll be a better artist as a result of it in the future i think so i i can already feel that i you know it's <laughs> i i think you guys are probably working through similar things of like okay let's get the voice going let's get our breathing mechanism like working again like all of that kind of stuff but there isn't this um urgent panic behind it. It'll happen because I've taken the time to give my body and brain what it needs. And I know that. And that is such a luxury in some ways. And also I think really necessary 
And I'm hoping that all of us going forward can add more balance into our lives because I think that that directly impacts the psychology of what we're doing, you know? So that, that, that was my, my big long soapbox. <laughs> the, idea, the idea of meditation is very important. I think that that, is, that, I, that ability to um, have the time, give yourself the time to quieten the mind it's very hard to stop thinking and do absolutely shut the mind down. And that's not what meditation is about. I think some people think, oh, meditation, I've just got to stop thinking for an hour. It's not that at all, because you can't, it's very difficult to stop. That's virtually impossible to stop thinking. But what you can do with meditation is use either guided meditation or you can use meditation to visualize yourself in, the, in a situation in the future. You can take emotions, good emotions from the past of wonderful experiences and project them in your meditation into a future situation like an audition or something like that. And, or you can just realize that the circle of life exists outside the opera stage as well. Absolutely. I'm gonna just move on to one thing that I think, cause we've covered a lot. We've done really well going in and out, I think with judgment and rejection and personal doubt and inner critics and all sorts of anxiety and stuff just going to ask if if you guys feel comfortable sharing um a little bit about physical appearance because um and confidence so physical confidence let's say um because we had quite a, a couple of things on instagram that people said that they were you know unfortunately physical appearance is part of our our jobs we cannot stand like an orchestral musician and do an audition behind a screen like they do in Europe um, because how we look more and more has become, yeah, has become part of our life and part of casting, part of everything. And I think that when people ask me about it, um, I, <laughs> we all have our insecurities, right? And for me, and, and, and I should say quickly that we should never laugh at other people's insecurities because you may look at someone and think you look skinny and you look whatever, but they will have their own stuff going on. So, you know, let's never judge on that, that um, basis. But for me, I try to live by the mantra that if I draw attention to something that I don't like about myself, other people will notice it. So this is, I try to, I try to, um, fill myself with confidence through these sort of simplifying the same tricks that we talked about before about general keeping anxiety at bay if I simplify my steps on stage and I think words uh, what is this character feeling um, and what's this character's day going on then whichever costume uh, designer <laughs> whatever they've chosen to put me in because we don't have any say in that or very little uh you could you you can somehow feel some power that you are telling stories and that is what people have come to see and if you look at ease other people look at other people feel at ease watching you mm -hmm. the audience feels at ease i don't know whether you guys have anything to talk yeah. about oh, that, that's a true that's very true it doesn't matter if i'm worried about my different parts of my body that I have these person, personal sort of things when I look in the mirror and think, oh, well, that would be nice if I was a Barry Hunk, not a Barry Chunk. Um, then, of course, if I get, if I, again, it's back to staying. If, I'm get, if I get that emotion in the way when I'm on stage, then it, it's not particularly helpful. And I, doesn't, I don't see why it's not valid. You can tell the story. It doesn't matter. You still tell the, tell the story. Be the storyteller. Yeah. Um, Sorry, Simon, you were saying? Oh, carry on. Sorry. I think I, I've taken a slightly different approach. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 uh, one, I'm a person of color. Uh, two, I'm also a bit on the chunky side. And uh, it's very rare that in storytelling, people of color are ever represented as, a, you know, the hero, the heroine, the princess. So I kind of took the idea of, purposefully throwing myself into the mix, <laughs> purposefully making myself uncomfortable so that someone who resembles me in any way, shape or form can see themselves in a story because it matters that we see ourselves. 
So, and, it, and it's paid off because I, people have come up to me and I've done Pamina's, I've done Sophie, um, I've done Countess, but especially with Pamina and Sophie, I've had mothers of little brown girls come up to me and say, thank you. My little daughter thinks that she can be a princess now and that she has every right to be beautiful because you played Pamina and you got the boy. I did Nanetta for that specific purpose as well so that chubby teenage girls, because I'm not a light skinny, oh my gosh, I'm so floaty, um, love and not the, not the ideal. And this is always so problematic with costume designers is that they work on ideal body types and ideal shaping. And when we talk like that with those kinds of ideas in your head, number two, adding on to the fact that we're talking about human archetypes. And so when you're dealing with human archetypes, we're saying that this is the correct iteration of the ingenue. And I hate that that's how people think. So I have purposefully thrown myself into those experiences to show that an archetype doesn't have a body type. An archetype does not have a skin color. An archetype is a state of being in a human being. And, I've, and I remember when I got asked to do Nanetta at the Met and it's that Robert Carson production. God bless Robert, it's a beautiful production, but it was also Lisette Oropesa with a skinny midriff and pedal pushes so tight that they looked like they were painted on her body. And I just thought to myself, Oh my God, I can sing Nanetta, but I don't think I can play Nanetta like that. And I remembered being so uncomfortable in my own skin. And then something hit me in the back of my head. A memory just came shooting forward. And it was me in high school watching movies where I never saw a chubby girl win. I never saw the chubby girl get the cute boy. The first time I saw that, I was at university and it was when Hairspray was finally made into a movie. And that was the first time I saw somebody who looked a little bit like me get Zac Efron. And I remembered how that made me feel like I could get the boy and it mattered. And I remember taking that energy and however uncomfortable I was, with this, my belly showing from time to time in this mid, this little like top that kept flipping open and me having to jump around in pedal pushes as well, not as tight fitting, but still there. And I remembered as uncomfortable as I am right now in my own skin, I have to be here because I need some other girl to know that she can get the boy. I need another girl who looks like me, who's never been told that she can get the boy. She has to see that she can. And so I've kind of gone that way. I go head on into the uncomfortable situation because I know that it matters to someone else watching it. And even now when I talk about it, I still feel the uncomfortable chills all around my body. But the way that I get through the discomfort is exactly what you said, Simon. I have to just live the story and I have to live it in my body fully and believe completely that this character deserves this ending and this story. So that's why it's important for me. It was also important for me why not to sing uh, Clara or uh, Bess in Porgy and Bess at the beginning of my career. It was so important to me to do ingenues because there are so few brown girls as ingenues on stage. It was so desperately important to me. It was a part of how I planned and built my career because I want other girls to not have to struggle as much as I did to see themselves win. I mean, may I just first and foremost say thank you Thank you for struggling through that. Thank you for making that choice and making that directive in your life. Um, I understand what you're saying on a personal level from the perspective of a larger bodied person being in an ingenue role. Um, for me as a larger person, I, I was told for so long that I would never be Carmen. I remember I was... Uh, rejected from doing my first Adalgisa from a company because they didn't think that I was believable as an ingenue was quite literally what they said. Um, 
the fact of the matter is, is that sizeism is something that is a gatekeeping thing. The idea that we all need to be a certain size is very much something that is, it, it has incredibly racist roots. It goes against the body type of black and brown people. And quite honestly, in this day and age, it cuts out so many people in the audience from being able to feel themselves seen on stage. And I cannot tell you in the last couple of years, as I've done more roles where I'm a romantic lead or an ingenue or something like that, I cannot describe the number of messages that I've received from people who say, I feel seen. I feel like I'm watching my own story up there. I feel like I have a place in this career. I feel like I shouldn't quit school. You know, so many things like that. And to me, I've gotten flack about it for sure. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like people, trolls don't uh, censor themselves at all when they think that they are better than another person, when they think that their opinions should exclude other people. But I am here to tell you that I, that's not going to stop me from getting up on stage and telling the story the best I can. And hopefully in the process, for me, one of the things that makes a life in performing worth it is the audience feeling seen, is the audience having a moment of not just, you know, like, I'm sorry, but if you can go on Netflix and watch any number of things, you know, that, that feature people nowadays, at least in 2021, that feature people in leading roles of uh, people of color, people of size, people of different abilities, you know, it just, this can translate to the opera stage too. I spent too many years trying to tighten the corset too much or trying to never turn to the side because I have a double chin or, you know, trying to always lift so you can't see the double chin. All these little strategies that quite honestly, at the end of the day, just took away from my ability to just be present and be a responding artist to the people around me. And I'm done with that. I'm just done with that. And I fully, fully encourage any singers who are listening to this to invest in loving yourself, in loving yourself exactly where you are, exactly how you're built. Invest in yourself as an artist, put that work in, be the best storyteller you can be. Because I promise when you're up on stage and you're doing that kind of mental shifting storytelling that really, really hooks the audience. There are going to be people in the audience who absolutely, they, they feel themselves. And that, that is transformative. And I think that's what hooks people into coming back to the theater, into not being in pajamas and watching Netflix all night. You know, like it's, we, we've got to have something that has more of a hook in truth. And the idea that everybody on stage needs to be thin and white is just incorrect. And so I am here for keeping that gate from closing, you know? But I also think what's really important is exactly what you said. There's, there is a bit, there's, this is still somehow the last gate for keeping people out of, from stay, off stage to, to, to say. I've, I've been in those costume fittings where the head seamstress is just tis tisking about, oh, I don't know how we're going to make this work. And I, if you're going to do this job, my dear friends, you have to be prepared to advocate for yourself in that space. And there, and as a woman, that's really difficult because we're so societally trained to be nice and courteous. And I'm going to tell you that in that moment when that is happening, it does not serve you to be nice. You just have to be 
dead set and hold your ground because it's usually other women that are gatekeeping you. And I find that very strange and scary sometimes, but I've been in a, I, I can speak from my own experience. I've had a singing teacher tell me that I needed liposuction. I've had a seamstress tell me that a costume is just not going to work on my body and she doesn't know how she's going to make it work. And I've had to tell both of those people in no uncertain terms, one, to the singing teacher, I said, your job is to train me to sing, not to comment on my body. Secondly, to the seamstress, I told her, your job is to make it work. My job is to stand on stage. So it is your job. You do have to fix it. And I'm, and I'm not going to, and I also said, I'm not going to apologize for how my body looks. Because my first singing teacher told me, and this is why I was very, I'm very glad that I had a large woman and a woman of color as my first singing teacher because she made it okay for me to exist in my body. And this is how the sound gets made, you know? As they say in the butcher shop, this is how the sausage gets made. So this is how it gets made. So you can't tell me that I have to do something different because everything that's been working has got me to this point. So I'm not gonna mess with this. This yes. is fine. You yes. just need to make it look nice. Go do your job. It is not my job to apologize for what works and functions and keeps me healthy and alive. I'm I think it's that if you have people around you in your life or in, in your work, in your coat with as a coach or a teacher or even like that, or saying those sort of things, is that that's toxic. Cut yeah. them out. You yeah. don't need that. You don't need that. You need people that will reinforce those views and support you. You don't need people who will say, life is Jesus, life is something, Jesus. That's quite amazing that someone would actually say that to you, to be honest. Which, by the way, your Nanetta was gorgeous. Thanks, man. <laughs> In every, from, from every standpoint of that definition, truly. I, I, I just absolutely stunning. Thank you. Oh, guys, thank you so much for, for giving so much and for being so open. It's, it's, I hope that everyone who's watching has got something from everyone and that we've covered some, given some experiences and, and, and um, that you don't feel so alone. That's what I wanted. I just, you know, and, and I think that of course we, we can offer, like I have a bunch of reading material that I can put up on social media and stuff that I've done a bit of research on. And, and I think that as Jamie's very openly talked about and uh, we've all probably been through different things with therapy, um, it's great to on your own personal journey to look for what you need, as Simon said as well. Um, we have a bunch of questions. I was trying to read them all. Um, I think the first one I'm going to ask you guys is um, someone has written, how have you dealt with the anxiety of the pandemic and how has that affected your singing, if at all? Jamie, you touched on this a bit in slowing things down. Yeah, um, I mean... I've taken a step away from singing, um, at least classical singing. Uh, I, I've done a couple of things here and there, but really I've kind of invested myself in giving my creative brain more space to function and trying out different styles that just make me happy to sing. You know, sitting down at the piano and just singing for fun rather than singing for job. Um, you know, and I, I'm coming back around to learning roles and stuff like that. We're getting back up on the horse now because it's, it's necessary, but, uh, I, I took a step away and I'm better for it. I think you guys I've, wanna... I've been, well, I've been a bit, it's been a bit different here in Germany. Like, I think you, Louise can also taste to that, that there's been, you know, piecemeal work that's been happening. So you, I've kind of kept a couple of gigs going. <clears throat> But at the same time, there's also been a, like, I remember there's this book that I read by Sheryl Sandberg, um, Option B, and it's, it talks about, but it's a book about grief. But in actual fact, it, it has kind of, I got to thinking about it a lot during this pandemic is that there's a lot of grieving that's had to happen because of jobs lost, opportunities gone. And so option, option A is kind of flown out the window because of the pandemic. And, then you've moved on to option B. And as the as a year has gone by of being in this state of flux, you I find that I'm not even on option B anymore. I'm on option C, D, F, going on down the alphabet. And I've had to process a lot of lost opportunities. And then at the same time, also given myself 
permission to not sing because I, I feel like that was my biggest thing. I, I gave myself permission first not to sing, but now recently I've also given myself permission to grieve because there was a lot going on that when you're in a certain part of your career, um, your losses don't seem as heavy as other people's losses. It's not that you're losing your mortgage, losing your house, but you're still losing. And I think what I've gained is the perspective that loss is loss doesn't matter. There are no gradients of loss. And I have had to stop grading my loss against other people and giving other people's grief more space than my own. So I've taken, I've taken to, to what Simon said, I've tried, I've started taking care of myself emotionally a bit better. And I'm starting to, I'm finally starting to let myself grieve the things that I've lost through this pandemic. And that's okay. And I'm okay there right now. So that's where I'm at. And a lot of other creative things are also happening. My creative brain is also not so much tied to my vocal apparatus, but it's really being creative in other ways that I'm also extremely proud of. And I'm very active in making other things happen. Yeah, I think that so I agree totally with the, the grief idea. And I know um, that idea that when you you think, of pro and you've worked a lot, and there was a right at the start of lockdown, I was supposed to be doing um, uh, a big debut, a big role debut in Frankfurt, and then that was taken away and we replaced it with something else. But um, we were able to do a opera, but not the one I'd spent uh, three months learning. And there is a grief attached to that. Um, but at the same time, I sort of tried also to give space but also look at, take a long, hard look at my voice and what I was doing and where I was doing it. And what, what were the, um, what were the things that I thought I could keep improving? Cause I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm sort of been doing this quite a long time now and getting on a bit, but I probably got maybe what, 10 years of sort of doing this left in terms of at the, at the level I want to sing at. And um, I'm thinking then, okay, how am I going to be a better singer coming out of the pandemic than I was going in and a lot of that actually was with the very things we're talking about today it's it's I can sing the notes but whether I always sing them with freedom and with flow and with uh, complete in the moment uh, commitment uh, and whether afterwards I don't sit at home in the apartment and just go through the whole score and call myself a fool I mean those are things I've been working on I've been trying to work on that mental side of the pandemic tells you that uh, you can exist. Life does exist without opera. It's a shame that it has had to, but it does exist. And you can find that bit more balance. So I think I was going along with Jamie. I hope, hopefully, um, hopefully when I start rehearsals again in, in May, uh, fingers crossed, that I'm a better singer and a better artist, a calmer artist, and uh, but but with more energy, if you know what I mean. Because I also feel that my 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 life has sort of it it slowed i was jamie i when you were talking about your the sort of train ride the fast train ride that we were on i i i also felt that it was getting to a kind of fever pitch um by february actually by january i didn't know my ass from my <clears throat> and i just I, like i i really found it difficult to 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 be able to be in the moment and and enjoy what I was doing or even take in what I was doing. And I also, what you've said, Simon, about sort of the memorizing stuff, I was having serious problems retaining um, words and retaining things because for me, I find, and I know that this is a tried and tested thing, that if you learn something very fast, you forget it very fast. So, um, and that's what I was doing constantly. Um, um, so for me, that, that has been a plus of the pandemic. Um, However, the negative side for me has been learning to cope with not being able to plan. And because of these losses that we're all feeling um, and the rug being pulled out from underneath you at any moment, I, I find really destabilizing. Um, but as you've all touched on, it gives you this idea very sharply that life in fact is not about opera and is not about singing and that there is more to it, that, that family is really important, that friends are whatever family you choose, your chosen family is really important. 
um, and that um, you need other things to, to find balance and to find stability. Um, and that, that has been a, a great side to it. But I have really felt for um, a lot of the people who are, are watching today who are um, either studying or mostly those who are coming out of their studies who are in, who are in the beginning of, of a career. And I, I find um, I'm very sorry for, for that position if you've lost first first jobs because that's, that's not funny right now. And um, um, hopefully the world will look better in a, in, a, in a year or so or less, I mean. It was a great phrase I heard that if you can't go outside, go inside. And um, that is sad when you're trying to start anything. And if you've got a new business going or we're in our, our business of singers, singers, but also if you're, you've just opened, gone self-employed at a job or something like that. Uh, that though, but if, you can, if you've used that time to actually create something inside yourself and to develop something inside yourself, then it, you, then it isn't a wasted time. It's, it, it, it is an investment in your future. And I, you have to think of it as the, the, the singing job is a 30-year career, if you want, or plus 30-year career if you want it to be. And it's not a sprint in that respect. It, it does take time. And you use, think of it positively so that you can use this time to invest on the inside so you can make everything work on the inside. So when you're ready to go out into the world again, you're ready, you're prepared, and you've got that. But, you know, the, that Dalai Lama quote, um, uh, <laughs> If you can do something about it, then you've got no need to worry. And if you can't do anything about it, why worry? I mean, the situation is beyond our control in so many ways. Yeah. So focus on what you can control. Focus on what you can improve within that environment. Hi, River, by the way. <laughs> um, there are two, a lot of the questions that were sent while we were chatting, we've sort of covered. So there, one question is, when looking for a therapist or professional help, do you think it is important to find medical professions with specific interest in musicians or performers? Or do you think the anxiety should be treated in the same way as any other work-related anxiety? I mean, from my own perspective, my the therapists, I've, I've worked with two. Uh, neither one of them were specialists when it came to music. They were specialists when it came to eating disorders and anxiety. And those were the two that I needed to tackle uh, in my own life. Uh, they're wonderful therapists. Uh, so even with a pressing career on my plate, uh, they were able to, to help uh, me work through all of that kind of stuff. So I, I, I didn't find that I personally needed somebody that was a specialist. However, I know that, uh, in fact, I've got a good friend who's a therapist who works with artists specifically when it comes to performance anxiety and stuff like that. So if you have a need for that particular thing, there are certainly people out there who can, can help with that. But I also find that um, I also worked with a couple of therapists and with things like performance anxiety and high performance and like working on a high performance level, um, it, that also does translate to other industries. So you can also speak to someone who works with um, high performance athletes or people in high, you know, High, highly demanding jobs like CEOs. So there are some general things that speak to any profession, but if you want someone who fully understands what your lifestyle is like and what you're going through, and what you also have to remember when you're dealing with a therapist, it's a question of how much do you want to explain before you get to what's going on. And sometimes some people don't want to have to explain, well, this is what my day is like, but you want someone who might just get it. So if that's what you need, then get someone who specializes. But it's before seeking a therapist, you also have in kind of figure out, not to say, I don't, I want to make sure I say this probably, but also figure out what it is that you need from that experience. If it is just somebody to talk to, then sometimes it's just nice to have someone that's just a general anxiety specialist that can just help you there. But if you want someone who's going to give you tools that are specific to what you do in, for this example, being a musician, being a singer, then that's okay to ask for that as well. And also 
don't be afraid to go to more than one person when you start. Like it's not always, it's like trying on shoes. <laughs> they may, it may look really pretty. The office and the chairs may look really comfy, but if that person and you are not vibing, you're not going to get anything out of it. And you're just going to be wasting an hour of your life where you could have been doing meditation instead. You know, funny, thing, funny thing, same thing with voice teachers. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think the thing about the therapy anywhere is that if you're going there, whether it's a performance anxiety, anxiety generally is a very deep, or we talked also, Louise, with that word imposter syndrome we talked about uh, earlier as well, which is which is all very is closely linked to anxiety and it's linked to um, uh, perfectionism, imposter syndrome type of thing. They're all very closely, they're sort of fear-based uh, issues and as human beings we tend to develop those at a very early age they're, they're things that are really um that a lot of our personality is really formed by the age of sort of six or seven and so then things then either go in different directions but a lot of our core beliefs and values are based come there so i think a general therapist can help uh get into that anyway but as as golda said some, if you want specific tools for performance, specific people who's going to give you an action plan, then you might want to go to someone special. But the key thing about any therapist, I think, is they are, they are there to guide you. You have to do the work. The work has to be done by you. A good therapist will, 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 will not give you the solution. They will maybe guide you on a path for you to find the solution, and that's much more empowering. And I think that's what it's about, understanding you have the power to do that yourself with help but it's your power we've got a question about oh sorry Golda go on sorry, I just wanted one final thing I also just wanted to make it very clear that there's also nothing wrong if you if if you need medication to help you get through anything there's absolutely nothing wrong with it so if you find that a therapist isn't really working for you then I am fully I will always fully recommend that you see your GP, get your hormone levels checked to see whether or not you actually do need chemical help to help your body figure out what's going on so that that can help along with talk therapy. So psychiatric help is never a bad thing in my book either. I will just go ahead and for solidarity for anybody who has been struggling, I started anti-depression medicine during uh in the last month or so uh which has been a really really wonderful step it was something that was needed i fully encourage same as golda was saying i fully encourage whatever steps you need to take to be the healthiest you you can be absolutely here for that thank you guys um there's been a question about rehearsals how do you feel safe to try things out in front of colleagues specifically in terms of trying to get out of your head being present to tell the story and not do what you think the director or conductor want rather than giving you. So we've touched on that a little bit, but I guess it's, there were quite a few questions about this on Instagram about not feeling safe or, or secure enough to, to, to go to, to show you, to, to, to tell stories for you um, and trying things out in front of colleagues. Is there anything anyone wants to add to what we've already said? I mean, for me, it was, I, I kind of turned a corner with this particular thing when I, I really, really had the realization that every single person who's getting up in that rehearsal room is also feeling the same way. Everybody on some level is feeling really nervous. My, hands down, the most nerve wracking portions of the career for me, first day of rehearsal in the Zitzproba. Hands down. Hands down, opening night, not a problem. First day of rehearsal, zits proba, I'm going to be flubbing up the words. I'm going to be in my head. I'm going to be overanalyzing everything. And I had a moment probably three or four years ago where I really just was like, oh, everybody feels this way. Like everybody is feeling that and nobody's paying attention to me feeling this way. So once, once that kind of like actually sunk in, I'm not going to say that I no longer get nervous for the first day of school or for that Zitzproba, 
but it certainly took the nerves down and it gave me the permission to make the mistakes that I knew I was going to make because I was going to be in my head. It just took the pressure off a little bit. But I also think that they, on top of that, I think what people also don't realize is you've got to use the time when you're, if you're not at that place where Jamie, where Jamie's gotten to in her career, where you can just be like, everybody's in the same boat because really we all are, we're all nervous about something or other. But what I've taken, what I took to get to that place is I actually started paying attention to people when we weren't on the floor working in how people were talking, what people were doing. If somebody's sitting with their score, going through things that tells me, oh, that means that they might not be as musically secure as they want to be. So, oh, we're in the same boat. Or if the conductor is so in his score that he's not paying attention to anything you're doing, it you start to pay attention to the the sub, you know, the subtle cues that everybody's giving without realizing that they're giving them, that they're insecure. And also then being empathetic to that and being supportive of that, it also allows other people to then be empathetic when you have a moment. So if somebody, Louise, I'm sure you, like we've had those experiences. I, didn't we have like something stupid happen like in the middle of like our figure rehearsal where we were both just like, I don't think I remember how this reset goes anymore. And we've like done these roles for years. And it was yeah. like, you know, the, the first performance after the summer, and in the middle of a pandemic, and we were both just like, wait, how does how does Solari go again? Who sings first? I don't know, but somebody opened their mouth. And it's when you, what I found, what works for me is, I just tell people. And it's what I, it was also the thing that got me over my stage fright and my fainting goat, to see my fainting goat disease, is I started telling people I was afraid. And the minute I was told people I was afraid, people opened up to me that they were afraid and they opened up to each other and we could all just be afraid and calm together in the not knowing if things are going to work out and I think that's the thing just be brave enough to own it if you make a mistake I'm usually that person that if there's a mistake in an ensemble I go yeah that was me my bad can we do it again and usually someone else will go oh gee thanks I'm so glad you said it because I wasn't really secure in that moment you know what you do like I think in, the, in terms of the uh, rehearsal space though in terms of make you know going exploring a character in a rehearsal I think the the, the idea is that the word rehearsal is important it, there is it is you have to treat it as not an adversarial space but as a safe space and it's up to the people around you particularly in the opera company say to try and make that environment safe but I mean if I have an idea on a character and I want to explore it in a rehearsal I might have had that idea the night before and I might have sort of run around my apartment naked acting it out or or I'd have gone into a field and done a sort of um, you know spontaneous contemporary dance or something I want I think people it's a really good exercise to try make a fool of yourself do something stupid in front of just for you in a space that no one else can see you go on a beach and run around and sing silly songs or something make you make an idiot of yourself and get used to making an idiot of yourself for in your own space before you then go and make an idiot of yourself in front of other people mm -hmm. but there is an element of um five-year-olds at play in the rehearsal room and so try and keep in touch with that feeling of the child I think if you can tap into that feeling of how it felt when you were just when you didn't have to worry about it you were just a kid playing on the beach and uh, playing games and running around and uh, farting you know just get get over yourself it's yeah. you know a little bit and just go try and go back to what it was like that leads I into one, one I do make it valley all the time <laughs> I can't imagine Simon I really can't imagine no, don't go thank there. you for that thanks for that yeah. I um that leads into let's say the final question there is there are more questions but I think we've done so well it's an hour and 40 minutes we've done amazingly so it's just one last thing that someone said how can you safely channel all of this emotion into performing and that's similar I think the, from what you've touched on Simon you know, in a, in a way that's healthy and expressive musically, she asks. Um, and for me, it takes going too far emotionally, privately, or in the safety of rehearsal space, 
um, or in a practice room, I, working really, really solidly technically and then going as far as I possibly can, really mucking it up technically and realizing, okay, cool, too far. I just touched on a real life experience for me, a real emotion that I can't possibly sing Sophie, top C sharps, floaty, floaty moti, um, whilst feeling as emotional as I do when I sing this music, you know, there has to be an element of, of better balance mm -hmm. with that so that you yes. remember the emotion, but you don't experience it as fully as, as you do the first time. Yeah. yeah, I think definitely that, that, that if you, and that's why I would say in the rehearsal room, push yourself, make the fool, go far. I mean, I remember when I first did uh, second act Valkyra and I was at the end of the Voltan monologue, I was going, oh, we're going to sing the third act. <laughs> you know, because I'd, cause I'd gone for it. I thought, yeah, I can do this. I'm a big, strong boy. I can do that. No, but you learn from that and you learn, of course, pacing of course fitness of course you have that's part of the process when you do a new role for the first time and you're going in there there's there is a you have to sometimes say to the conductor i'm sorry look hang on a minute i'm just blocking and i'm experimenting in this scene at the moment don't beat me up on the musical side for, for 15 minutes because i will get it wrong because i'm just my brain isn't that I'm, I'm i'm not that smart i can't do all those things yeah exactly i was gonna do that yeah and so um that's that's the responsibility of you you have to take that responsibility to say i'm going to play but i am the one who's actually going to have to sing at the end of the day and go out, out on stage so i have to know what the emotion feels like what the, how much stamina i'm going to need do i if I, emotionally i can't give all my uh, adrenaline in, in, in my first act aria when i've got a big aria at the end of the opera as well i've got to understand you've got to be professional that's the job yeah. that's the job that was also, that's also the same thing that you just said, Louise. It's a, I, my singing teacher was actually the person that got me to do this. She, she would, at the beginning, she would, I would always come with my arias perfectly learned and like, la, 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 singing pretty. And then she would go, I don't believe anything that you're singing. Now more, more, more. And she would keep pushing me emotionally in my singing lessons to just go further and further to the point where I would literally, either I'd burst into tears or I'd go really hoarse in my throat because I was like, <gasps> the emotion is just too much. And then she would say, okay, and now you can take it down 10 degrees. And that's performance level. So I think it is about, I have found that what works for me is not to do it necessarily in a rehearsal room with other people because I'm, I've got, there's too much going on. But when I want emotionally to be connected to an aria, I do all that work in my practice room with me in front of the piano. I also do a lot of scribbling all over my score just, and then when I'm in the rehearsal room, I also break it down. I'm very clear with any director and conductor in a rehearsal room, especially if I'm doing something for the first time. I know how my brain works. And I also tell people at the beginning of a rehearsal process how my brain functions best and how they can get the best out of me. So I take that responsibility and I tell them, I work best if you tell me geography, tell me the emotional situation that you want me to inhabit, and then just let me do it. Let me figure it out so that I can choose how I pace it because I still want to, because that's still a creative process that remains my part of what's happening. It's choosing when, that's what we as singers are doing. We're choosing when to expose moments in a score. And if it's, if it's too prescriptive from other people, then you just become a singing machine. And then they might as well just put R2D2 on stage and just have him beep bop boop across stage and that will be Agatha's aria, you know what I'm saying? But if you want my Liza Liza, you need to let me do it. And, you, and so that's how I do it. So I go, I do, I do all the emotional work before I get there. Then I listen to what the director says about what psychology he wants me to inhabit. And then I try to marry that to what I already have as an idea of who this character is. Do they fit, do these ideas fit together? If they don't, why don't they fit? How can I make them become one thing? What do I need to throw out of my ideas? What can I throw out of their ideas without them noticing that I'm chucking some of their stuff in the trash? Um, and then using the conductor's musical notes and cues to build a 3D schematic of a human being and then let that human being live their life for two hours plus. 
It's true, Golda. And I remember being so impressed when we did Figaro together that you are so, I don't, you have levels and layers and a plan and, and you're so strong. And, and I am a chameleon of a disastral proportions that just takes everything and tries to deal with everything and does everything and then has a cry and then sorts it out and then is better. And that's how I deal with stuff, which is just not, I mean, it's, it's my tried and tested way. It doesn't always work, but um, actually it does. I mean, this is the way that I have found that I like to try to, I'm a bit spongy and I like to try to take as much in as possible. And then I, like you, I then cipher it, you know, siphon it out and work, decipher what, what I need and what I don't. Um, because there's there's that element of pleasing, isn't there, that you want to do all the time. Sorry, Golda, go on. We had a lot of conversations during this figure that we were doing. It was a it was a it was a revival of a production that neither of us had ever done. And the Countess and the Susanna were just women that we had never encountered on stage before. We both just did not agree with what the director had imagined these women to be. And it was just me and Louise constantly during breaks going, so what? how does this work? <laughs> and just both of us being extremely confused most of the time. And there were so many moments when both of us would just stand and look at the assistant director and go, no, not, not sure I, I figure, I don't know if I understand you or if I agree with you, please explain this again. And I, I was so impressed. You just seemed to make it work. Whereas I was just like, I'm gonna need to go home and sit with this. I'm <laughs> with you. Louise is very good. She's just like, yeah, I'll give you what you want. I'm in a, I'm usually in a corner going, I need to stew with my thoughts. Leave me be. <laughs> they're, both, they're all valid. That's the point. And that yeah. sounds like that anyone listening doesn't, there isn't a prescription, a prescriptive way of doing it. You have to do your way. And yeah. I think, again, it's all back, I, I've said it a few times this afternoon. It's about, it's about knowing your worth and your, the value of your worth and well, believing in, and trusting in that. Trust yourself. Do you, have a, do you have a contribution? I was going to say your your worth, but your limitations as well. We we all have different limitations. I am blown away by the singers who can cry and sing at the same time. I've seen it happen. It doesn't make sense to me. If I start crying, my throat shuts down. Yeah, yeah. But you know, it's for me, it's it's about working through the emotions. A lot of this is you know when I sit down at the piano. And I, like the thing that's on my mind is that Jake Heggy has just written me a song cycle. And every time I sit down to sing one of these songs, I'm like, <laughs> I'm just crying my way through it because it's perfect and beautiful and so meaningful. And I've got to do that in repetition in my own space to be able to just get the crying to start to subside. Um, you know, there, it changes for what you're doing too. I mean, speaking of Jake Heggy, one of my favorite roles is Sister Helen in Dead Men Walking. And Sister Helen ends the entire opera after the dude has been lethally injected and dies. She ends the entire opera singing He Will Gather Us Around solo. No, Nothing underneath her. And there was no getting around crying. I was gonna cry. It was gonna happen, but it was also appropriate. And it was okay that my voice broke. And try, this going back to the perfection thing, I, the, the perfection wasn't necessary in that moment. Honesty was very important in that moment. And just investing myself in that was uh, an exercise of <laughs> trust, trust in myself that I could get through it, so. I, I mean, just to add on to that, just, uh, we should wrap it up but just to add on to that for me watching something that's perfect ultimately is quite boring so mm. I would much prefer to watch you break down Jamie than a string of your most pearly pearlison notes because they are gorgeous they are so gorgeous but if it's only that for the whole time yeah. I don't know it's not as honest or oh, it is because you make such a beautiful sound and and your voice actually when it, it really breaks me, you have such a soulful voice, Jamie, and I just, oh, you know, it gives me goosebumps just thinking about you playing that role, seriously. Oh, um, yeah. But but for me, perfectionism is not the goal. It's just not the goal. No, 
I think it's also very important. It's, it's, it's perfectly fine to make sounds like that on stage. Yeah. It, it's, 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 it's communicating. It's honesty. You're being the character. You don't have to be, it doesn't have to be perfect technique. Mm. No. Scream, you can shout, you can, the voice can crack. You can use it for effects. You can, but it, as long as it's real. Because like at the, at the end of the whole, at the end of the day, what we all have to remember is that singing is an extension of a fundamentally human expression and that crying out that's needing to be heard in the dark. So whatever you need to be heard in the dark, it doesn't matter how it is, it means you need to do it. And so let that be an authentic outcry. And as long as it's authentic and based in honesty, it will always be fundamentally more interesting than artifice. It's why it's why human ears don't like auto-tune. <laughs> you, it's, it's fundamental. It's a part of, it's a, how we are built up. Our, our ears and our brains, the synapses know when something is false or based in artificiality. So firstly, don't use that as your base setting. Use that as a color that you can put into your voice, but at the core of your voice, there has to be authentic human boom, boom, boom from the from the base of your chest, you know, and lower. That's that's that, what that idea, the, the peak performance thing, right where we started right at the beginning. It goes back to we are energetic people, energetic beings. The voice is an energetic instrument. We are acting a role in an, transferring energy to the other characters on stage with us. We are kind of transferring energy to the audience and the audience is transferring energy back to us. So it is a completely sort of holistic experience. And that, it, that transfer of energy is much is, and when that transfer of energy is genuine and without filter and is honest, it, that transcends anything. That is, if you want a definition, then, that, then you're getting close to perfection. Yeah, that's getting close to peak performance. That's peak performance right there. When Absolutely. it's just when it's just the centrifuge of just yeah. and the audience play their part in that. Yeah, and then you know that it's work when you hear that split second of silence before that crash boom of applause because you knew you know you hit them and they got it. And then it's it's just poor crashing of sound. That's yeah, we cool. miss you guys. We, yeah, we, we do. you guys, seriously. It's the, the audience element is absolutely a part of the magic. We miss you guys. Oh, guys, thank you so, so, so much. What an absolute pleasure to chat to you all and see you all. Oh. So good um, to see you, yeah. yeah. Well, I've recorded this and we will chat about how much we want to, to um, let out and post and blah, blah, blah. But I hope that you guys who've been watching have gain something, feel less alone, feel a bit uplifted in these slightly weird times, very weird times. <laughs> so thanks guys, thanks very much. Yeah. And we'll end it here. All right, <laughs> bye guys. All right.